Welcome to another Grammar Highlights video. This class is being offered through Maranatha Baptist University online. And this is part of a class which is Exegesis and Exposition of Romans. And our goal in this video, as in the other videos that we're making, uh, we're basically highlighting the grammar and vocabulary of each chapter so we can better understand the argument, the overall argument of the book. And I want to begin with uh, reviewing chapter 2 by looking at one of the verbs in verse 1. It's the verb process. It's, it's a verb that means practice. Um, this is going to be very important because sometimes people who are religious, and he is going to focus in on the Jews, which have applications for religious people in general. Um, he's going to say basically that he says here, Therefore, you're inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who is judging. For in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For the same things you practice, you who are judging, the one who is judging. This is an intensive use of altos here, so it would be translated the same things. And the one who is judging is just a participle, the one judging. But since we understand from context, he's talking to, a, <clears throat> in this case, a hypothetical Jew, a broader application to just someone who's religious, confident in their religious traditions and in their heritage. He says, well, if you take a good moment to think about it, you practice the same things. Um, now, when we think about the theology of the Apostle John, like in 1 John in his letter, when he says, those who are born again do not sin, the idea is what we're seeing here, those, those who practice sin. Um, there's this consistent pattern of sinning. Someone who is born again, someone who has truly under, heard and understood and received the gospel, and they've received Christ as their Savior and they're converted, the Bible teaches, they will not practice sin. Well, chapter 2 is written to those who assume that their religious heritage uh, is going to justify them and what the Apostle Paul is saying. If you take a good moment to consider, you'll find that you who judge other nations, for there may be lack of having the law, their lack of religious heritage and, and pedigree, you actually practice the same things. And so this leads us, uh, we'll see how this leads later to chapter 3 when he says, everyone falls under the condemnation of God. We're, we're all guilty of sin. We're all destitute of God's glory. And then he gives the gospel which is the amazing message of God's grace in forgiving sinners. But we have to understand this point that all of us are guilty of practicing sin uh, when we are outside of Christ, before we have a changed heart. Let's take a look at verse 4. He says, Or uh, the riches of his Christates would be kindness, and it's the kindness of him, talking about God's kindness, and the anokes could be forbearance, in macrothumias, the word for patience, he says, kataphrones, do you, do you despise? It's, this is very important here. He says, to the riches of the kindness, of his kindness and forbearance and patience, do you despise? Ignorant that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. Okay, now when we think about what he's saying here, let's take a quick look at verse 5. This is a very important precursor to the theology that comes up in 9 through 11. Because there, it's, it's, some people base, if they're a hyper-Calvinist, they'll, they'll base their point of view on verses, uh, chapters 9 through 11. But here, we, we've got to understand the context of the whole book. If we go a little further, in verse 5, he says, According to your scleroteta, that's a hardness, according to your hardness and unrepentant heart. So your hardened and unrepentant heart. You treasure to yourself wrath and the day of wrath and the revelation of of the righteous judgment of God. So if we look at verse 4 and 5, he's very clearly saying that if someone ends up judged and condemned by God, it's because they've despised the mercy that he's offered them, they, they've been ignorant of his kindness, and they have hardened their heart, and they have an unrepentant heart, and therefore they, as he says here, treasure to themselves wrath and the day of wrath. Now, why is this important? Let's take a quick look at Romans 9.22 because we want to include this in the, in the broad context of the book. Here we are in Romans 9.22. And he says, uh, basically, what if God, desiring to show ten organ, we just saw that word in verses 4 and 5, right? Show his wrath, that's the idea. Uh, to show, if God desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power... Dunaton is power, the power of him, Altu. And then Eneken uh, endured with much patience the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction or prepared for destruction. 
be easy to get hung up on a, on a word like this and say, oh, they're prepared for destruction. They, uh, God has prepared them for destruction just as God has prepared others, the vessels of mercy, for glory. Well, first of all, we want to keep uh, in mind the broader context. Even in chapter 2, he talks about the hardness of people's hearts that reject the, the, the mercy and the kindness of God, and that has consequences. The other thing we could point out in verse 22 here is that katartis mena is a participle in the middle voice, which seems to suggest that the vessels of wrath prepared themselves for destruction because of their unrepentance and their hardness of heart. That's an interesting point that we'll talk more about in our Grammar Highlights video over chapter 9. Now let's come down to verse 9, because we see an interesting contrast here between verse 9 and verse 10. Verse 9 would read something like this, uh, Affliction and distress upon every soul of man who is, and then here's the word, if you look at it, you've got as the prefix kata plus the verbal form of ergon, which has to do with work or produce. So the idea is uh, producing or making. Ta, ta kakan would be evil. So affliction and distress upon every soul of man who produces or who practices or who, who, who makes evil. To the Jew first and to the Greek. And then he says glory and honor and peace to everyone. Okay, now here is, we could almost call it a synonym, but we have to ask ourselves, well, why did he include the prefix here? Here we've got kater gadsomenu, and here we just have ergadsomeno. These are definitely parallel expressions, but for some reason uh, he, he, he used kata up here and not down here. And let me just make a suggestion here. If we do a word search for this word, let's see, it's kater God's oh my. There it is. Let's do a word search for this and see where it shows up in the book of Romans to see if we can kind of get at the way the Apostle Paul tends to use this word and see if that lends any insight in how he uses it for those who practice evil versus those who practice good. And, and he uses it here in Rome, chapter 1, verse 27. And the way he uses it here is when he talks about homosexuality. He said, men with men producing or making or working out uh, that which is shameful, and the wage which was necessary of their error in themselves receiving. So the way he uses the term here has to do with people who practice sin, even to the point where it works against their nature. He's, he ends chapter 1 by talking about the vices that characterize uh, nations without God, uh, lead them to do and to believe things that are not convenient even to the point they've rejected God, and they even begin rejecting their very own nature. And so the nature of the verb here, which I think kind of carries connotations down here in chapter 2, verse 9, where we just were, is that it's the person making the decision, but it's also the forces of sin producing diabolical uh, practices and that have diabolical consequences too. Uh, and I think that's the force of the kata here in verse 9 because he's talking about those who practice evil. And in a sense, like we saw in chapter 1, the evidence that God exists is very strong because of the law that's written in our hearts and the law that we have as it's written in the Bible. But when we resist that law and we practice evil, we, it's almost like, I'm going to call this the diabolical kata. We have to work against God's Spirit, even to the point we have to work against the evidence to produce what is pleasing to us, but it's wrong and it's sin and it doesn't correspond to the facts and to nature. If we look at a few other uses of this verb, it says here the law produces wrath, in kind of a negative connotation there. Uh, in chapter 5, he says, knowing that affliction produces patience. Okay, this is uh, very, it's got a tone of victory in chapter 5, but again, it's kind of with this negative concept of thlipsis. If we look in verse uh, chapter 7, he talks about sin, uh, which through the commandment produced in me all manner of lust. And then throughout chapter 7, where he's talking about this great conflict we have, desiring to do evil, uh, but wanting to do the good, and this conflict he chooses to use, we can see this verb, kater god somai, throughout. So if we go back to our passage here, maybe the exegetical importance of this verb right here, kater gatsamenu, would be that 
because of their striving against the Holy Spirit of God to produce what is evil, that is why everything that happens is justified. It says, affliction and anguish upon every soul of man that does this right here, that they produce the evil, striving against God's own spirit, to the Jew first and to the Greek. Let's take a quick look at verse 12. It says, For as many as sinned without the law, anomos, without the law, without the law they shall perish, and as many as sinned in the law, in other words, the Jews who should know better, if they sin, well, through the law, they will be judged. And what happens here in verses 13 through 15 is basically, we want to put these in parentheses, starting in verse 13. All of this should go into parentheses until verse 16 because he's going to further describe this. And it doesn't make as much sense in the argument as far as the flow goes. Um, so this is all in parentheses because he says here, not the ones who hear the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. It goes on for a little while, but then he, he finishes verse um, 12 here in verse 16. He says, and as many as sinned in the law through the law, they will be judged. And here he says when, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men according to my gospel through Christ Jesus. Here in verse 15, there's an interesting word that appears. The word for witness or martyr is martureo in the verbal form. And here it's the verbal form with the prefix sum. So let's take a quick look at this uh, verb in context to see if we can get at the importance a little bit. And it says here, who uh, show forth the work of the law written in their hearts. So he's talking about Gentiles who understand to a degree ethics just like the Jews do because the, the, the law which is, came into being through God's work in Moses uh, who, who wrote the Old Testament law. To a degree it's written in our hearts as well. And he says here, bearing them witness, bearing witness with them, and then he is modifying here the conscience. And between one another, their reasonings or their thoughts, either accusing each other or excusing or defending one another. So uh, this is an interesting word to use to describe the, what the conscience does in people's hearts. In chapter 1, we see that the invisible things from God uh, are, are clearly seen, understood by the things that are made. So that when we think that, well, uh, for someone to believe in God, they have to take this leap of faith in the dark. No, there's enough visible evidence, experiential evidence, that God, the God of the Bible is true. And to a degree, this idea of our conscience-bearing witness has to do with uh, God's written law. It, our own conscience bears witness that this is the true word of God. And this comes from the God who created the universe. There's a, there's a moral order to all of this. And again, the, the fact that it's um, in context is talking about what happens between people, even in Gentile nations that may not have God's written law. The soon, the prefix, which means uh, with, it's often kind of a reflexive uh, with one another kind of idea, makes sense because uh, this is what happens with one another. Ethics doesn't result from just my own idiosyncratic ideas. When I consider my own life and I consider the lives of others, there is this phenomenon that happens that in my own conscience, I can, by interacting just with people, begin to sense God's moral law. There's My conscience bears witness. And that is something that's both corporate and individual. Okay, moving down to verse 17, we're going to see... Uh, a very important verb that occurs quite a few times in Romans, uh, kakao mai or kakao sai, here it's an infinitive form, and it has the idea of boast. This is used both positively and negatively in the book of Romans. And here he says, and if you are a Jew, who you're named a Jew, and you're confident or you rest in the law, and you boast in God, now we have to make a pause here because later he's going to say that no one naturally loves and worships God. So how can a Jew, if this Jew is what, someone who's practicing sin but is boasting in his religious heritage, how can he boast in God in a good sense? Well, as we go through the rest of the book, we're going to see that he talks about this boasting in a religious heritage more than really boasting in Christ because of a personal relationship with God. And as he uses it in chapter 2, it more has that sense of boasting in religious heritage because of how God has worked among that people historically. So here it has a little bit more of a negative sense. 
he says again down in verse 23, um, who, who boast in the law. So it's possible to boast in the law, but then he says, through breaking the law, you dishonor God. Later in the book, he's going to use this same term to talk about the boasting that we do in Jesus Christ. Uh, but here it clearly has more of a negative connotation. Then I just want to point out one more word here. It's a verb. In verse 26, it says, If then the uncircumcision, the righteous deeds of the law keep, and it says, not shall not the uncircumcised, shall not his, his uncircumcision as circumcision be reckoned or, or be reckoned to him or be regarded as such. Logis thes etai. Logitomai occurs quite a few times as well in Romans because Romans focuses on the just decree of God, what God considers to be just, God's just pronouncement. And I just want to point out there's a very popular word in Romans. And the voice of this verb here in verse 26 is also of importance. If we look at the middle here, you've got face, right? Logis theis etai. So theis is the future passive morpheme. This is something that will be done to this person or to this group of people at some point in the future. And this highlights the fact that what God thinks about something, what God decrees about something, is all that really matters. If God decrees that someone who is uncircumcised and maybe without religious pedigree, without a religious heritage, is justified, then that person will be justified. And even though the Jews re retain their identity and they do have a special place in God's plan, he says some interesting things down here towards the end of the chapter. And he says, for he is not a Jew who is the idea is one who is openly or manifestly or physically, mainly referring to circumcision. He says here, openly in the flesh. There's the word for circumcision. But he who is a Jew, krupto uh, is the idea for inwardly, whose circumcision is of the heart, in spirit and not in letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. And he's not saying that the Jews don't have any important identity or important place in God's plan, but he, all he's trying to emphasize is the fact that if you're boasting in your religious heritage and the external sign of that is circumcision, as it was for the Jew, then your, your boasting is in all the wrong place. We need to learn what it means to boast in God and not just in our religious heritage. And so here we see the Apostle Paul dicing into pieces the hope that the Jews tend to have just because they're descendants of Abraham that they will be justified. As he's going to point out in chapter 3, everything hinges upon what God considers us to be. And the only way to be justified is through completion of the law which means we have to go to God through Jesus Christ, the only one who completed the law.